All right, guys, we're going to take a little different uh, trip this week with my new buddy Bradley at Idaho Whitetail Guides. Here we go. There exists a threat from anti-hunting groups to politicians trying to give our land away, and we won't stand for it. Those vast western landscapes provide the space for our wildlife to thrive and a place for hunters and anglers to fuel the fire that sparks their soul. In this show, we share our love of hunting, fishing, and conservation. Here, we provide the foundation to meet these threats through passion and the grit of the American outdoorsman. Welcome to the Western Huntsman Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of the Western Huntsman Podcast. This is Jim Huntsman, your host, coming at you from the Broken Time Studio right here in Clark Fork, Idaho, where it is nice and sunny and snow is a melting, and I can't wait for more to melt. So uh, this week, I've got Bradley Dammerman on with me to talk about, um, well, we're going to talk about hunting. What do you think, Bradley? I think that sounds pretty good. That's right up my alley. Pretty good topic, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I appreciate you coming on, man. Um, I've been actually Dirk, uh, and I was telling you this before we started recording. Dirk, Dirk Durham's been telling me to get you on for uh, like almost a year, I think, and I finally nice. tracked you down and uh, got a, got a time set up, and I'm I'm pretty excited about this conversation because. Uh, you're one of those uh, dudes that kind of dips his toes into a little bit of everything when it comes to hunting, just based on your website. Um, and I think you've got a pretty good uh, outfitting service going. Well, we're not going to say where, right? Just in North Idaho. Yeah, yeah, I do. I'm proud of it so far. So give us a uh, give us a little bit of background information. How'd you get into this? How'd you get into guiding and and outfitting and and you know the whole lifestyle that it is? Because you run hounds, you do you know baiting bears to hunting elk to whitetails, all sorts of stuff. How, how'd you get into this? Well, um, really, I always say the foundation of my start would be hounds. You know, I uh, my grandpa had hounds, my dad had hounds, like so I. I grew up with hounds, you know, and then I kind of just branched off from there. And, um, and then, you know, probably when I was, I think probably, uh, 90, let's see, now I have to think it was probably, uh, 99 would be the first year I ever looked for a guiding job, Oh, gotcha. you know? So I, I just kind of reached out to a, a guy and, uh, Andre mostly and uh, got hooked up with that and started guiding pretty young. And then it just kind of went from there. Have, uh, so, and, and that's like basically all you do now, right? You're just, you're a full-time guide and outfitting service. Yep. We do it full-time. Yep. I'm going to jump back on your website here. Um, Idaho whitetail guides. Uh, the, the website says bear hunt, cougar hunt, deer hunt, elk hunt, wolf hunt. Tell me about the uh, wolf hunting. What, what kind of wolf hunting do you do? Um, well, you know, we had wolf hunt, hunt hunting on there, but I don't, I haven't actually done that a lot because I'm so tied up with the hounds. A lot of times I'll throw that in on a cat hunt, you know, and um, um, if we get a cat early, like on a, say, a six, seven day hunt, I'll, uh-huh. uh, we'll go mess around with wolves, you know, it's just kind of a feel in hunt. Sure. Um, I don't get a lot of guys that are just looking for a, a, a wolf hunt, so I haven't done that. That's probably the one hunt I haven't done a lot of, um, mainly because of my time. I don't have the time for. And that's what I was going to ask you is uh, I, I'd be curious to know if there's like people that reach out to you and are like, hey, I just want to come to Idaho just to hunt wolves. It's um, It seems like it's getting more popula- popular, but uh, no, not a lot. Not a lot. A lot of guys are like they'll, they'll want to come on an elk hunt or a, a deer hunt and then they'll – can I get a wolf tag just in case, you know, you see one and I'm like, yeah. So that's usually seems like, uh, the conversation with that or, or if they do bring it up, you know, I'll say, well, why don't you come on a cat hunt or why don't you come on an elk elk hunt? And then if we get your elk or cat early, we'll go mess around with the wolves is usually how I handle that. I, I wouldn't say I'm an expert at, at, uh, um, wolf hunting, but I have, we have, uh, gotten, gotten a few and, um, 
uh, I think I'd be as good as anybody. I just don't put the time like I do with the hounds, you know. Sure, sure. And yeah. No, I suck at it, man. <laughs> I have <laughs> I've never killed yeah. a wolf. I, uh, but it's it's interesting. That's why I wanted to ask you that is because I I was reading this weird stat that these people, I don't know, some anti-hunting pro-wolf advocate group or whatever, uh, somewhere down near Yellowstone National Park, I'm, I'm assuming they're in Bozeman or something, um, was talking about how, oh, well, wolf hunting only generates $400,000 kind of thing for the state uh, based on the amount of tags sold. And I just, it wasn't a clear picture. You know what I mean? Like they're most people that have a wolf tag have a wolf tag because they're cheap and they pick them up as a as a tag along to like an elk or a deer hunt like you were talking about. Um, mm-hmm. So they just have the the tag, so it's not really painting the the, the full picture there. Um, but right. yeah, no, that just that just actually clarifies what I responded to him with. <laughs> like like that is not telling the whole story. Bird watchers do not produce more revenue than uh, hunters do. So um, get over yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure <laughs> what do you what do you like guiding for the most man um well you know i, I well i logged before i started guiding mm-hmm. so you know i was working 40 50 hours a week and that's a lot of hunt time you know and it was driving me crazy so i me and my wife had talked and i was like i've got to be able to hunt more you know sure so really it started out just my passion for hunting um, but, and then as I started hunting, you get to meet just about every person you can think of different kinds of people, you know, you get to meet because we run, you know, anywhere from 60 to 70 hunters a year. So we're getting all kinds of different personalities and it's just kind of fun to meet those people and, and kind of hear their stories. And I get a lot of first timers, you know, and there's nothing better than, uh, um, you know, calling in a bull for somebody that's never killed an elk, you know, and, and being there and just watching the emotion. And, and some of these guys that, that I've taken, you know, they, they've, uh, hunted for a lot of years and never were successful, you know? Sure. And, um, I've gotten, gotten a milk or, or mountain lion or whatever it might be. And it's just, there's nothing better to, mm-hmm. to just, just be there in that excitement and that moment, you know, with them, it just keeps you going for sure yeah i'll bet man D- do you get like uh, clients from all over the country all over the world or like where do, where do people mostly come from I'm, I'm always curious about this yeah so definitely elk hunting is the big thing you know really that's really what keeps us in business uh-huh. and a lot of my hunters come from back east so you know pennsylvania wisconsin um michigan um you know states like that back there for whatever reason you know because they don't have what we have well, you know we're really obviously you know we're how lucky we are here oh sure um and you know and the guys that don't have a lot of time or knowledge you know it's it's cheap just as cheap to hire me and come right on out and i got a place for them to stay and and we'll get them right out there hunting but uh occasionally i'll get a idaho guy or it seems like more now than um ever before you know because you know how Idaho's blowing up sure and, uh, so we get a lot of people that are just moved here you know yeah, and maybe yeah, trying yeah. to learn and and stuff but i like those far away guys it's not a horrible idea though for for folks that have never hunted elk and and they just like moved to idaho and they want to hunt north idaho i feel mm-hmm. like i feel like hiring somebody like you to take them out for a week would knock years off of their learning curve cuz cuz north idaho is so like it's just different. You know what I mean? It's, it's just different hunting elk here. Yep. It is. And I, I, you're right. I'm a hands on, you know, visual person. I got to watch somebody do something before I can really get it to sink in. So if you're, if you're like that, man, yeah, hire a guide and, uh, you know, it'll cost you a little money, but the knowledge you could learn in a week uh, uh, would just, just boost you so much, you know, totally, totally. It would, it would, it would be worth the cost. I'm uh, I'm checking out the pictures on your website here. Um, you got these little cabins people staying, huh? Yeah. Those yep. are badass, man. How did you build those? Yeah. Yep, I did. Uh, um, so, um, well, when we decided we were going to buy this uh, business, you know, we knew we were going to have to have 
the area I was buying would work out where I live. So I was like, well, we'll just build cabins on our place. We have 80 acres here. Uh-huh. And, uh, um, well, I didn't, you know, I was a logger. My wife was a nurse attendant. And, uh, so we didn't have a lot of money, you know, so I had to learn to be a carpenter pretty quick. <laughs> to build <them. laughs> Well, so, I'm, uh, I'm specifically interested in these because, um, I, it's not looking like I'm going to be able to get a builder out to build our house. I, we live on bare land. I don't know if you know that and, and are living in a fifth wheel until we can build mm-hmm. a house. And so it, it is looking more and more like we're going to go through another winter living in our fifth wheel. And mm-hmm. I want I want to build a little cabin like this so we can like you know spread our legs out a little bit. So I might have to come down and check these out, dude, and like get some ideas to build my own. Yeah, yeah, I would l- love for you to come down and check them out, and you can stay in them a night. Did I, I and I a, think you'll like them. I got an odd question on them. Are those? Uh, did you make the whole foundation on those cabins on those those sauna tube concrete tube things? Um, no, those are, that's just the first, uh, the front porch. You just could the build them on skids. Somebody like you, I'd probably build those same cabins on skids, but yeah, that's just the deck. I do have an actual foundation under, um, huh. but you wouldn't have to have that, you know, where you're just wanting to get by for a while. Okay. That's that, that's my biggest hang up right now is figuring out what kind of like foundation to put them on just cause I used to build houses, but this was, you know, 20 mm-hmm. years ago. So I'm, I'm just trying to figure out. How to do these, man? Yeah, I might have to come check these out. Those are sweet. We'll turn this whole episode into how to build a cabin. <laughs> yeah. Well, the first, the yeah, that's, the first cab. So the very first cabin, you know, I, me and my wife, uh, well, um, we got some time, so I'll just kind of go through it. We uh, we decided we were going to buy this business, and we made a deal, and so we had to, which they tell you not to, but we had to drain our retirement account, you know. Sure. At, to buy the business and really when you're buying an outfitting business i don't know if most people know but most of the time you're buying paperwork yeah like a client you know, list that, kind of thing and you yeah know, the they, they always they always say a client list thing but that's just not true you know that's part of the sales pitch you you don't really get a client or at least i didn't I'm not saying it ain't possible um but yeah i was supposed to get a, a client list and knowing now you know people still got it. They never really knew me. So they weren't really willing to just switch over. Um, so I had to build my own clientele, but, um, anyways, so we, we got, uh, we got, we, we drained our retirement accounts, pulled up what money we had. And like I said, um, bought the business and then, uh, I knew I was going to have to build these cabins, you know? So, um, my dad's kind of in the reclaimed wood business and he was cutting beams for, um, a guy in Iowa a timber framer Uh and he's like well i'd like to go on an elk hunt so um maybe i'll build bradley a cabin so to make a long story short i cut the beans on one of the cabins shipped them to uh, iowa and he built the trusses for me on one of the cabins yeah and uh and just it's just a kit a timber frame kit you know i did everything else but it's a kit and he uh anyways I took him on an elk hunt and, and actually called him in a bull that he shot with a muzzleloader on any weapon season. He, season, he brought a muzzleloader. Oh, really? Oh boy, <laughs> <laughs> pressure's on. You know, October, but I did a man. I did manage to get a bull to come in and he shot it at 20 yards with his muzzleloader. Oh, that's, but anyways, that's cool. Yeah. So, anyways, um, well, the guy's good guy and everything, but he was dragging his feet. You know, like you know, right now it's hard to get carpenters to get anything done. You know. Mm-hmm. So then uh, I started getting nervous and I already had the foundation poured and I was like, shoot, you know, hey, where's my cabin? You know, where's my cabin kit? You know, oh, I haven't had time, you know, and I'm thinking, well, I got elk hunters coming, you know, my first group of elk hunters. So I went to town framing up. I just decided I'd frame one up and that's where my first one come. I actually framed it up and built it and it turned out pretty good. And then a year later, he finally came through on the other ones and then we got two. So which which one I'm looking at the inside pictures. Which one did you frame up? The one with those um like standard looking trusses or the one with that like uh 4 by 4 looking darker trusses? Yeah, the the that's the one I framed up. So the, that's the just second. reclaimed wood. That's just for looks. Those are fake trusses. That I built and then there's wooden doors. I don't know if that I'm not on the yeah, website. Yeah, the wooden the wooden doors. Yeah, those big dark wooden doors. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I built those and stuff and um, saved a lot of money, you know, doing a lot of stuff myself. Sure. 
Yeah. That yeah. I've been. Yeah, you pretty handy, man. <laughs> That's cool. Sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, I, we got that out of the way. I might have to pick your brain on that later, cause yeah. Yeah, I, for sure. Be, that's what I'm gonna be doing. As soon as this snow's gone, I'm breaking ground, dude. It's gonna be fun. Heck yeah. <laughs> yep. So busy time. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so elk hunters are your like primary most busy season. Uh, mm-hmm. I want to talk about bear, cougar, you know, bobcat, whatever, uh, running hounds. Um. You you you'd mentioned that it's like your favorite or your original passion. I don't, I don't know how you put it, how you phrased it, but uh, tell us a little bit about hound hunting, how you got started in that, and and let's have a conversation about that because like, like I told you before we started recording, I don't think hound hunting gets enough credit, and Thank I want to learn about it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'd love to talk about. I love talking hounds. Uh, so. Um, uh, the way I phrased it was it's kind of my foundation. That's really where I started, you know, uh-huh. um, in my hunting career. So, um, my grandpa had hounds. I just grew up around them. You know, I was lucky that way. And, um, not only grew up around them, grew up around an area here in Northern Idaho where my backyard was endless. You know, I mean, I could go forever and hunt yeah. wherever I wanted, but, uh, that's where I really started out. I was just hunting with my grandpa and my dad and, um, uh, and then a long time buddy Mike Pinklock, uh, that um, guy that's from Back East that used to come out here and hunt with us all the time. And uh, Bradley, you're kind of you're, cutting, you're cutting out just a little bit. Did you move around? Not really. Oh, there you go. Now now it's a little more clear. Sorry about that. Yeah, we were just cutting out a little. I'll bit. go in a little closer to my. I'll go in a little closer to my Wi-Fi. Maybe it's kind of Wi-Fi. That's why I drove in this phone. Oh, gotcha. But it, yeah. Yeah. But anyways, uh, um, so, so that's where I, I, you know, I started, I was six, six years old, probably seven years old when I, I can remember some of my very first hound hunts. And, uh, so it, it's always been in my passion. A lot of hound hunters, you know, they'll get in and out of it, you know, mm-hmm. they'll get in it and then they'll realize how much money it costs and how, you know, maybe the wife don't like it or whatever, you know, and they get out of it. But I've always been in it. I've never got out of it. I stayed in it. And I think it's really, really important. Hound hunters are really, I'm glad you brought that up because they're really important on predator control. Why, you know, why do you say that? Can you can you kind of expand on, on the importance of hound hunting with predator control? Because I, I agree, uh, but, mm-hmm. but you're the expert. Well, you know, I mean, just just the, the amount of bear and we're, and like, I'm not a huge killer, so I don't kill everything. I mean, I let way more bears and lions go than I actually kill. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if every hound hunter in the state of Idaho is killing, you know, let's say even one, just say even one lion a year and say like three bear a year, just the one hound hunter, um, that's a lot of predators. Yeah. If you took if you took uh, all that away from the if you took the hound hunters out of that, that's a lot of predators, you know. And uh, I usually just hunt four to- uh, lions a year with my outfitting business, so I take usually four toms only, big toms a year in my area. I take out of the mix, and there's always you know there's always every four toms a year. And I mean, I'm just the amount of elk that I'm saving and deer, you know, is a lot, you know, mm-hmm. although I don't want I don't want to wipe the predators out. Don't get me wrong, because I, I mean, I love to hound hunt. So but you got they've got to be managed, you know. Oh, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I think that's always a misconception that that non hunters had not not even not not even necessarily, you know, like anti hunters, but non hunters have this perception that people that hunt predators are are trying to just totally annihilate entire populations and it's just not true and 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 it's it's like it's kind of like the baiting argument you know i bait for bears and Mm -hmm. and people that have never done it um they they talk about baiting and hounding like they're two of the same things in terms of oh they're just you know there's not a lot of sportsmanship in it there's it's so easy to do and and it's like (laughs) clearly (laughs) clearly you've never done this shit (laughs) yeah (laughs) they don't know what's they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. Because I mean, you you mentioned it earlier in the show that I hunt a lot of different things and I do. Mm-hmm. And I can promise you and I'm talking and I have baited, you know, in this business, but I'm talking hounds here. I've out of everything I hunt, 
I've got more dedication, time, and effort into hounds. I mean, it's a full-time job. I'll bet. Um, just keeping a good, and I'm talking a good pack of dogs, you know, ones that are going to catch a game. I mean, they've got to be, they don't just naturally, you don't just go pick up a hound and, oh, I'm a bear hunter and, and you're catching bear. Yeah. I mean, we've got, we've got thousands of hours into um, training, training these dogs and um, getting them ready. You know, I mean, just endless amount of time. Luckily, I have a good wife that puts up with it. <laughs> Put it that way. <laughs> yeah, that's always an important <laughs> part of it, man. Um, that, yeah. that, that, uh, I, I know, I know what you're talking about when you're talking about like a lot of houndsmen, they, they get out of it. And a lot of the time it is because, uh, they married somebody that didn't have the tolerance or understanding of what kind of commitment it takes to be an effective houndsman. Um, mm. and I, I, I'm curious from your perspective. So I, I've never actually gone hound or, or hunting with hounds. Um, you know what? Mm-hmm. I take that back. I think. I, I did go chase a uh, wild boar one time and they were running hounds on them. Uh, yeah. But that day we didn't find any. And so anyway, other than that, I, th- and that was years ago, a couple of decades ago. Um, other than that, I've, I've never gone on a hound hunt. And so I'm curious if it's like from the passion side that you're, you're talking about. Um, I'll, I'll start it this way. I love upland game hunting. And it's not because mm-hmm. I like shooting pheasants or think that pheasant meat is better than anything else. I love working my dog. I, I love seeing my dog uh, work the field and jump pheasants and retrieve them and, and every the whole process. Um, yep. I hate when he finds a porcupine because he's just not <laughs> super smart and it never fails. I'm poor, you know pulling quills out of his face. Uh, you know, yeah, he's, oh yeah. he's getting too old now. But anyway, uh, the point being. Like that's that's where my passion for upland game comes from. It's not necessarily the hunt itself. I just love being with dogs and watching them work and do their thing. Is it similar with hound hunting when you're talking about chasing bears and mountain lions and and whatnot with a hound? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's all about the hounds in my eyes. I mean, the killing part is so low on the on the game that I don't even think about it. I mean, I let and I don't mean this in a bra- bragging way or anything, but I let you know, 70 bear go last year without killing them. You know, Jeez, man, if, if, if I was, I need to go hunting with you. What the, <laughs> I can't find them. <laughs> well, I'm hunting every day of the season too. So that helps. But, uh, um, anyways, uh, where I'm going with that is it's, it's not about the kill to me at all. It's all about the dogs. For sure. I mean, you get a, you get a hound puppy, you know, just a little, little tiny thing. And, and then you you raise it, train it, and then it's your literally your hunting partner. I hunt with my dogs more than I do people, and I'm a guide because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I mean I don't always have hunters in, so I I still hunt every day. And so a lot of times it's just me and the dogs are going out there. So I might you know I have a eight year old dog down there that it, literally she's my buddy. You know she's my hunting partner. Sure. All of them are my hunting partners. Um, the kids love them wife loves them they're just part of the family i mean they're literally part of the family here mm-hmm. oh uh, i know how you feel yeah. we worry about them and and we take care of them and that's another thing a lot of a lot of guys are we get a lot of critics that say we don't take care of them and that's i'm sure there's guys out there that that do a poor job but mm-hmm. i can promise you we take care of our dogs i mean they're they're just like our kids you know they're number one priority we don't we sacrifice a lot to make sure we're home here taking care of them you know i got 11 of them 11 of them tied out here so Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely man it's the same it's the same damn conversation every time when when you're talking about the critics they're always going to try to find something uh that can strike emotional chords in people right and and one Mm -hmm. easy way to do that is be like oh hound hunters don't take care of their dogs and and these dogs live a miserable life because that's that's the kind of stuff i've seen too and i know it's untrue uh, but like what you said, there's always going to be somebody that, um, you know, doesn't take care of their dogs and that's going to reflect on the, the rest of the group. It's just like, you know, whether if you're a trapper or if you're a, you know, if you're baiting bears or if you're calling in elk, you know, there's always an asshole that makes, mm-hmm. that reflects on the rest of us. Uh, and, yep. and they, they drive that home, man. Um, I'm, I'm yep. curious with, with uh when you when you say you get a like a hound pup what does the training process look like uh getting a new pup started so um 
lucky luckily for me i've been in it for a long time so most of my training comes from my older dogs uh-huh um yeah you got to get them to handle so the first thing i i i do with a, a young pup is i i make sure it knows its name <laughs> you know <laughs> and the kids are ha- the kids are real handy for that because they go out there and play with them take them on walks and stuff but just i the first thing i do is get the handle and get them used to being on a leash although i don't use leashes much but get them used to being tied on a leash or are loading up in the pickup or on the four-wheeler that's really where i start just handle and getting used to driving around in a on a we hunt off four-wheelers a lot mm-hmm. so you know with the gates and stuff so um get them kind of used to because they'll get kind of sick and they're when you first put them on there they get car sick and stuff so that's the number one i just kind of get them used to it get them used to the other dogs and then i just start turning them loose with my older dogs you know and uh and then it and and they really learn a lot from an old dog you know if they'll stay with an old dog you know they'll really pick it up and then pretty soon it, they kind of just slowly start you know mm-hmm. trailing um on their own and and you know figuring out that they're chasing something and and then you got to get the tree and down you know and you get to see okay well we got this thing caught it's up in the tree you know and then get them to bark at it and it's a long process but having older dogs are are really nice to to train young dogs if not you're you know there's guys that get old hides and stuff and mess with that and drag them around and get the puppies to chase them um or hmm. you know or just go hunting with somebody that has good dogs you know if you got a pup and you're just getting into hound hunting you know if, if there's an old guy or, or somebody you know that's willing to take you take advantage of that you know that that's yeah, catching game that a guy that you know if there's a guy that's catching game and you know he's catching bear and a lot of bear you know you know maybe kind of invite yourself hey you mind if i tag along you know and bring my pup um that's really how you could get started you know how long does it take when you have a when you have a brand new pup how long until like they're to a point where you could take them out and they'll pick up a they'll pick up a trail and they'll know how to follow that trail and tree an animal and bark like what is it two years or like what tell Mm -hmm. us about that a little bit so, you know, they're just like elk hunting. There's lots of caliber hunters, you know. So um, what I mean by that is, uh, so like when I say when I had a logging job or job, I mean, I was working 40, 50 hours a week. So I'm hunting every second I can. You know, if I got a little bit of time after work and it's still mm-hmm. daylight or, or weekends, you know, it's going to take you a lot longer to have a finished dog than the position I'm in now. Like I said, where I can hunt every single day of the season. So the typical, probably the typical hound hunter is going to tell you a finished dog is going to be around four to six years old. I've heard that a lot and read that a lot. I kind of shake my head at it, but that's what a lot of, a lot of people say. I'm huh. more at the year and a half, two year old, year old. Yeah. I pretty much know if I'm going to keep them at a year and a half old. They gotcha. better be doing a lot at a year and a half. Otherwise I'm, I'm giving them away or, or getting rid of them, you know, uh, Sure. giving them to somebody that just wants a hound pup or you know for a pet or something yeah yeah, yeah but yeah. uh so so in my book uh they, they should be if if you can hunt a lot and you're hunting five six days a week during the season you should have a finished dog by two years old easily hmm. and well, and they should be doing pretty much everything that's not too bad that's not too bad no yeah, because that, that's that's about what I was thinking. So it surprised me when you said a lot of people are thinking, you know, four to six years. But I guess if they're not hunting as often as you right. are with them, that that would make a little bit more sense. Um, I got mm-hmm. a question on that. Um, the I, I know a lot of people wonder this. A person in your shoes, uh, it, like I'm in between where you're at. I, I, I still have a day job, but I probably hunt – quite a bit more than the than the average joe out there uh mm-hmm. but i don't get a hunt full time like you are um you ever get sick of hunting um i gotta be careful what i say here but uh <laughs> so i'm in i'm in i'll, I'll just be honest here guidance a job yeah. you know when i when i first when i first uh got the business it was literally because i wasn't hunting enough and I wanted to hunt, but I made a, what I mean by a job is, you know, we've got book work, we've got to go to shows and we got to find these people, we got to book them and then we got to hunt them hard, you know, when they get here, it's, it, it turns into a job. But when I'm, 
when I'm hunting with my dogs, I can't say, and it's just me. And most, and most clients, I don't mean anything bad about them. I have a great time with, and, and, and I have a lot of fun with, but when I'm hunting alone with my dogs, I can't say I've ever been burnt out or didn't want to go because I just didn't feel like it. Yeah. I'm pretty, I, uh, you would think I'd get burnt out. Maybe I'm too hard headed. I don't know. But <laughs> I, I just don't, not with hounds, you know, I really sure. don't. Sure. It's, I just really love it that much. I mean, it's a big passion of mine. Well, I, I mean, it has to be, man, like the commitment to being a houndsman and owning that many dogs and taking care of them and working them and training them and feeding them and, and you know, just all the stuff that goes, it, it would have to be a, a passion. Yeah. Um, I, I hate when I hear that somebody just kind of wants to dabble in uh, being a houndsman um, because I think those dogs get, they, they don't, they take the blame because they, they haven't been properly trained and, and they don't mm-hmm. produce the results that they want because they're just kind of dabbling in it because they're not as passionate like as, as somebody like you are, um, which yep. is, you know, a, a big reason why I'll never be a houndsman. Um, yep. I would love to go on some hound hunts. Uh, just, to, I, mm-hmm. I'd love to see that whole process, but I'll never personally be a houndsman. Um, so getting back to what you were talking about, um, getting, you know, a little bit of burnout here and there with, with other things, uh, but not with hounds is, well, actually let's, this is always something that I'm curious about just from like being a guide is, is is a whole different ball game in terms of, in terms of being a hunter. Um, and, and your experience in the outdoors is totally different in, you know, I guess the, the, the one-on-one with some of the clients or whatever. Um, a lot of people listening to this are, are like contemplating hiring a guide, uh, whether for Mm -hmm. this year, next year, whatever, what kind of things as an outfitter do clients do that, uh, maybe rub you the wrong way or, or they do something that, uh, if they're listening, they'll know not to do while they're (laughs) out hunting. (laughs) Does that make sense? I'm, this is, this is a, a service I provide to outfitting uh, companies right here. <laughs> right. So, yeah, I, I would think just off the top of my head real quick that I always laugh about. Um, um, I, I told my wife when we started this, I said, honey, we're going to be honest and we're going to work hard. Like we're going to be proud of this business and you got to understand we're hunting public ground. You know how it is in Northern Idaho. Mm-hmm. It, you know, there's other hunters and stuff. I mean, it's real hunting. It's not like we've got private ground we're hunting or anything. So yeah. we've got to put a lot of effort in it. So the effort's already in there. Uh, the guides I've, I've actually, I could talk a lot about my guides, but they've been with me from day one. You know, they helped me build this business. We are dedicated, you know, so I think the biggest, what really rubs me the wrong way is I'll get a guy that'll come into camp, you know, and he'll, he'll buy a, a, a hunt. And he might be a super nice guy and stuff, but I get, I get this a lot. And they'll say, you know, uh, I got five or six buddies that are, are uh, going to kind of see how this hunt goes. So if I'm if I'm successful, they'll probably buck. Uh-huh. And I don't know why. I don't know why, but I think they I think in their mind and like I'm not mad, mad at them, but I think in their mind that they think that's going to make me hunt harder or try harder. Yeah, yeah. And it's just not. You know, <laughs> the, the implication of of future business, I get threatened with that on in my day job all the time. Um, yeah. The 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 I don't know the vague promise of future business or whatever. Um, I think a lot of people miss and or they don't misinterpret, but they they overestimate the power that that has. <laughs> right. Um, think, you know what I mean? Yep. Um, hmm. So. Yeah, that's one of them. And then if you're just looking for a guide, you know, I, I mean, I would want to know, you know, like, like say you're looking for a lion hunt, you know, you get, first of all, you're going to want to know, is the outfitter, is he, is he the one taking me or is he hiring a houndsman? And if so, not saying that that's bad, you know, they might hire a good one, you know, Sure. but and then you want to find out, you know, uh, call references and stuff. You want to find out if, uh, you know, how many lions are they killing? Because really, you know, lion, you know, they've got a bad name and stuff, but really I could hammer the population of lions if I wanted. Yeah. I mean, I I could literally hammer them. So you don't want to go with an outfitter that's running 10, 15 lion hunters a year and shooting females. Um, um, 
you'd, you'd probably want to stay away from that guy because, you know, he, he's just pumping that outfitter is just pumping. And there's a lot of good outfitters and I'm not slamming on outfitters by any means, but you know, that's a guy, that's a business guy trying to see how many hunts he can pump in sure. per season, you know, sure. not really. And I'm kind of proud of, I've always just shot Tom's and, and, and only taken four a year. Um, I'm actually going to, I just bought a new outfit in area. So I'll, I'll be taking a couple more. So I'll, I'll bump that up to seven. Cause I, I feel like I can take that many with all the ground I have now, but, oh, uh, yeah. In the area uh, you know, you're in, dude. you just have a little more, right. You just have a little more, uh, and there's other hun- hunters too, that are killing them too. So I got to keep that in mind, mm-hmm. but, uh, but you'll just have a better quality hunt. Um, your guide might not be as burnt out and stuff. If that makes sense. You know, yeah, yeah, you're definitely kind of looking for somewhere to go. Um, and same with the elk hunt, you know, if, you know, really find out, you know, cause there's outfitters that are literally just the office guy, you know, yeah. I would probably recommend maybe going with, with some younger guy that that's, you know, all in and he's guiding and he's running the business and he's working hard, you know, mm-hmm. he's going to, he's going to want to work harder for you. I feel like, you know, just some yeah, things to I ask that the outfitter yeah. if you're looking. Yeah, for sure. For sure, the, the the yeah the the more hands on kind of ownership yeah mm-hmm. thing I think I think would be pretty critical. Um, man, I totally forgot what I was just going to ask you. you. You said something. I know I get on like, rabbit trails. No, 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 no. <laughs> I my mind is a rabbit trail, man. You'll say something. I'm like, man, I need to ask about this. Man, I need to ask about that, and then I go blank. Um, yeah. but so I, I guess is there is there like a what you would interpret as like a misconception that hunters or or the popular because i know that there has been in the past some um contention uh like you know from somebody that hunts this way and thinks maybe the hound hunter ruined their hunt or or vice mm-hmm. versa or yes. you know whatever can you talk about that and and maybe yes. d- dispel any myths that might come along with that that's kind of funny because when Dirk was here, you know, you're talking about Dirk Durham. We kind of talked about that um, mm-hmm. a little bit. So, hey, speaking so of I, that, before we get back to that, did Dirk stay in one of those cabins? Yes, he did. Oh God, you just a let anybody stay times. there, huh? I know it. <laughs> Jeez. Well, I was telling you, he came he came up here and hunted with me for a few days and got my treatment, and, and then he got to go down and like you stomped me with that one. Not not only was he successful. But he got a cabin to stay in. I'm just like, dude, set up a tent and I have a, a frying pan we'll put over the fire, man. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, he wasn't roughing it here, that's for sure. <laughs> but, no, he talked highly of you, and I remember him talking about how much fun he had there. So yeah, I pay him a lot of money You're to good. do that. I bet you'll, yep. you'll probably see him again. <laughs> it's hard to get serious with that guy around, though. You know? <laughs> he's, he's such just, yeah, he's no. just. He's one of my favorite conversationalists, though. He, he he's oh, just man. got a good, great, easy way to have a conversation, and uh, it's fun. It's like it could be super light and funny and and hilarious, or it could be like super deep and heavy. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, he's just one sure. of those dudes. He's just one of those dudes. Yeah, he's he's like one of my favorite people. I know. Yeah, and I the first time I asked him, kind of, you know, what got him into hunting, man, I I realized I could sit and listen to this guy all day long. I mean, I he's just super. When he starts in on a story, I mean, it's detailed. <laughs> it is. It is. And like, it's so I can't relatable remember all the details like that. And I'm like, he's talking about a story when he was a kid. You know, I'm like, that's impressive. I know, <laughs> so right? Like, I feel like I've had too many hangovers to recall that kind of detail from when I was young. I don't know what the deal is. He needs to drink more whiskey. I know it. Yeah, and he, you know where he grew up. You would have thought he would have hit the whiskey a little harder. You would have thought. You would have thought. <laughs> uh, shit. But so, no, yeah, so, uh, yeah, we're back to what you were talking about. I'm yep. glad you brought that up. And I, somewhere around the house, I, and I don't know, my wife might have thrown them away, but there for a, a long time, I saved these letters that I've gotten off my pickup throughout the year. Oh. Because I, I, I used to, and I've never deliberately messed anybody's hunt up, you know. Sure. Um, I, I respect, uh, I'm a, a big archery elk hunter, love it. I, last thing I want to do is is uh, uh mess somebody's hunt up you know but throughout the years you know i'm either walking into a bear tree you know to go get my dogs or something mm-hmm. and i come back and i and i don't know five six different times i used to have the letters i still probably do if i looked uh, i'd have letters on underneath my windshield wipers or something you know 
you you know you f an asshole and uh, uh, blah 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 you and your damn hand hounds and get the heck out you know they're archery elk hunters oh and um so i didn't like that you know like i was like man that just gives us a bad name but you know you got to think that's my passion just like that elk hunt is you know it's not my fault the seasons are are right then i don't like yeah, if i see overlap. a rig, if i see a rig pulled up to a gate i'm not <laughs> of course i'm not gonna drive around their rig and go in there and, with my barking dogs and, and mess or hunt up but you know sure. you turn loose on a bear they could go miles you know you don't know where it's gonna end up and i gotta get them so so there's been that um di- division you know and i i just like i told dirk nobody wants their hunt messed up you know and you know from living in northern idaho it's worse now than ever you know there's more hunters and, and oh, everything yeah yeah don't get and, don't even get me started on that one <laughs> right so you know nobody likes it nobody and i told like i told dirk i said you know you just if if every elk hunter when they got mad because the hounds come through or messed up their big six point or whatever you know just stop and think you know if that guy's been hound hunting for 10 20 years how many elk he's probably saved yeah. you know the li- the lions that he's killed the bear that he's killed the predators you know i mean really you should almost thank them <laughs> and, and the- in a way and also, in a the, way. yeah, I, I totally agree. And and the vice versa is true. Like how many times, yes. ha, what, how do we know that there's some, you know, elk hunters out there, uh, whether they're like Dirk Durham level or whether they're Doug Fluties out there screwing up hound hunts, you, you know, and, and uh, yep. there's, there's other that the shit goes both ways, right? This isn't just a one way yes, street. Does. And so, um, one of the coolest progressions, and I don't remember who it was that showed me this on on their trail camera. They had a bait barrel set up, and mm-hmm. uh, the the progression was, gosh, who was that? It's gonna drive me crazy. I can't remember. I, I want to say it was like Tyler Oaks or something. Anyway, somebody, and and they had a they had a bait barrel set up, and you see the black bear running through, and then like the next picture is a couple of hounds, and then the next mm-hmm. picture is another hound, and then like. I don't know, 20 minutes later, here comes the, the houndsman. And yep. it's such a cool progression. And this guy was, instead of upset that they had just chased a bear past his barrel, because, I mean, obviously he wasn't even there hunting it uh, mm-hmm. that day. He was all excited that he got this progression, and he was trying to find the houndsman, who it was, so he could show him this, because it's super cool. You know, here there goes the bear. Oh, there goes the hound. Right. Oh, there goes the hunter. You know, it's just <laughs> it's cool. And that's, yeah. that's the kind of attitude we need more of. Uh, because yes, I love that attitude. It, it, totally. It, at the end of the day, we're it's it's all of us that are on the same side of it. You, you know, we're we're playing on the same team here, and and yep. so I, I know that it's aggravating. I get when I'm an elk hunter, I get aggravated at other, other elk hunters sometimes. Um, mm-hmm. So it's okay to get a little irritated here and there, but but don't take it out to a point where you're leaving nasty letters on people's windshields over it. They don't know you're in there. Right. I know it. You know, that's just pretty pretty bad when it gets to that level but yeah no that's a that's a good story i like that i would have i'd like to see that yeah that I'll, I'll see that if i cool. if i could dig those up i'll send them over to you man it's it's yeah. super cool it really is because and it's a good bear too that they're chasing and mm-hmm. um, no idea if he ended up getting that bear or not but i'm assuming that bear treed and and uh he got him but not totally sure Let's take a quick break to give our show sponsors some well-deserved love. Let's start with Scree Extreme Mountain Gear. High-performance hunting attire and gear. Scientifically tested camo patterns. Complete layering systems. And in my opinion, the finest merino wool products to keep you warm, dry, and comfortable. It's all backed by a great company. Some of my personal favorites of the in the Scree lineup are the hard scrabble pants uh, for early to mid season, and then as it gets colder, I switch to the Kodiak pants for late season. The Bridger glassing mitts are like game changers, and I love the Nebo rain gear. Scree offers great packages on the website as bundles, like the elk bundle, that will completely outfit you for your favorite hunt. Oh, and my favorite part? You won't need to refinance your house to get outfitted. Try the starter bundle for less than 500 bucks. It's an insane deal. With the VIP sizing guarantee, you can exchange something that doesn't fit for free. I just had to do this for something that I got my wife. It was a little big, so I just sent it back. They covered the shipping both ways and exchanged it for the right size. So go to ScreeGear.com and at checkout, use promo code THEWESTERNHUNTSMAN for 15% off and free shipping. 
Phelps Game Calls, one thing that I love about companies that are born out of hunting is their story. Like Phelps Game Calls, the American success story that walks us through how something started small and grew into something big. Like Phelps, he started this company kind of as a hobby in his garage in 2009. Now, a little over a decade later, Phelps is one of the premier hunting call companies on the planet for good reason. They're the most realistic calls on the market, and that is saying something. Check out the amp lineup. For predator calls like the three-pack POR123 or the fawn in distress, check those out. Turkey calls, get a diaphragm, a pot call, or a box call and a complete line of waterfowl calls. Hit up the website, and at checkout, use promo code HUNTSMAN10 for 10% off. Phelps Game Calls, get them close. The Elk Collective. The best investment for hunting success is what's between your ears. Having elk hunting knowledge is what separates those who succeed every once in a while against those who notch tags every year. There's a very fine line there, and there's a perfect amount of time for listening to this now to get through the entire course before September. Improve your chances with a virtual course of over 140 videos that cover things like how to get elk tags throughout the West, scouting and e-scouting, beginner to advanced elk calling, gear, fitness, nutrition, shooting processes, hunting scenarios, strategies, and tons more. They've got some very big names on this platform that give you their personal expertise as you go through the course. It's the best way to make you the best elk hunter as you get into the woods. So go to theelkcollective.com and use promo code the Western Huntsman for $20 off. It's normally $89, so when you use my promo code, it's going to be the best $69 you've spent on elk hunting, and I guarantee you it's worth every penny. Check it out, guys. Hoffman Boots, let me give you guys a piece of advice from a dude with many miles on his feet. Never skimp on quality hunting boots. Hoffman Boots is a fourth generation, family owned company based in North Idaho. I've been sporting a pair of Hoffmans for close to a decade. Particularly, I like the Hoffman Explorer and the 8 inch. In my most humble opinion, again, Hoffman offers the most comfortable hunting boot that does the least amount of damage to my feet after several miles on the mountain. Very little break in period on these boots, by the way. Uh, I took them right out of the box and went on a crazy elk hunt, not even a blister. For hunting, they have the Explorers and the Summit Boot offered in insulated and non-insulated. And ladies, check out the new Women's Hoffman Explorer 400. They also carry lineman boots, winter pack boots, logging boots, and hiking boots. Get totally outfitted at HoffmanBoots.com and at checkout. As you know, it's coming. Use promo code, all caps lock, HUNTSMAN10 for 10% off. Last but not least, Tacticam. If you're interested in self-filming your hunts, whether for you know memories or making hunting content, check out the Tacticam products like the Spotter LR, Tacticam 5.0, and the Film Through Scope system, all of which are available at westernhuntsman.com, which helps support our fight against the anti-hunting movement. But my favorite is the Tacticam Reveal cell cams. I use these cell cams all over my property, and I'm like obsessed with monitoring the wildlife in real time with these cameras. They not only text me instantly when a buck or a bear is cruising through, my reveals make for excellent security systems. I know when the FedEx dude is delivering packages way down at the bottom of our driveway. And I also know if some knucklehead shows up to try to steal them. I know when someone's trespassing or if I have the kind of wildlife roaming around that I don't want, you know, like a coyote. And uh, I quickly react with my cat-like reflexes. Great for trappers, great for hunters, uh, security, anything. Guys, check it out at Tacticam.com because I don't have the reveals on my website right now. Uh, Let them know I sent you. Tacticam.com. Let's get back to the show. Here we go. Right. Um, here's another one for you with in, in because that scenario kind of plays into that but mm-hmm. um, bait hunters sometimes uh, which is what I do um, I, I, mm-hmm. I run a bait barrel well I, this year I'm running like three of them um, mm-hmm. and and people getting upset well the houndsman just came in and ruined my bait barrel is mm-hmm. it, first of all when you have a bait barrel set and you're getting bears hitting it and then let's say a houndsman comes by and the the dogs run past it or whatever they they tree a bear near it or whatever is it does it ruin that bait site no okay no nope. not at all I, and i agree i just i want to so I, I like it when other people clarify and verify things besides me no nope. there's guys that hunt off bait you know i got a buddy from wisconsin and that's all they do is hunt off baits it, it might chase 
if they have a real hard run, it might chase the bear off for a day or two, but that bear will be back. Mm-hmm. It always is. Um, now, if they kill the bear, obviously, that, <laughs> that's going to well, ruin sure. the bait hunter's uh, uh, hunt. But, you know, I think – so a lot – there's things you could do pr- – to prevent it i'm an expert at finding baits by the way i found 17 i found i found 17 baits last year by accident i'm not looking for them by the Uh, way i knew it i knew somebody (laughs) found my it was you wasn't it (laughs) (laughs) but you know a lot of times these guys you know they they set them up where it's easy to bait which makes sense right Mm -hmm. so they they got to bait it every day or every two days or every three days whatever their system is you know um, so they'll have a, a bait, you know, they'll drive in somewhere and they'll go in. Well, the problem is, is those bear travel. They don't just live at that bait, you know? Yeah. So I could, my dogs will run a 12 hour old track, you know, or trail a 10, 12 hour old track. So if it crosses the road, you know, cause your bait's down there 200 yards, I have no idea there's a bait there most of the time, you know? And if I do, I go, you know, I, I don't come back the next day or anything. I try to respect it, you know? But, you know, I'll, we'll just, we call it rigging. So the dogs are on the box on the four wheeler or on the pickup, you know, and they, they're striking the bear, you know, the bear scent. So we're, we're just turning the dogs loose because we know there's been a bear there and they trail it down to the bait. We have no idea that's there. And, uh, you know, so it's a complete accident most of the time when we, when we do bump into somebody's bait. So I guess ways to prevent it would be as a baiter. I would say no houndsmen anymore with the wolves in Idaho. Say say that um, say that one more time, Bradley. No no houndsmen what? So no houndsmen so no houndsmen um, is going to want to hunt an area with the wolves that are here now are going to want to hunt a roadless area very gotcha. bad. So okay. like big country. I'm not saying that there's there's probably guys there that say oh I do all the time and 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 I do sometimes, but more than likely, they're going to be away from the highway. Number one, mm-hmm. I, I will I will not hunt by the highway. I mean, that's you're not having fun. It makes me nervous. Sure. Um, and I'm not going to hunt where there's not a lot of roads. And the reason I used to, the reason is I've got to be able to get to my dogs. You know, if I find wolf sign or anything, and I I might need to get them caught up because of um, I find wolf wolf sign, you know, I've got to be able to get to them and get to them fast. I want to catch them off the bear or whatever I got to do if I find wolf tracks. So you can't do that on foot, you know, where there's no road. So I think if some of these bait hunters, um, maybe keep that in mind. Some, sometimes we're more than likely a hound hunters are going to be hunting and just try to stay away from that area. You know, maybe bait closer to the highway or maybe bait, um, um, in the wilderness a little more, you know? Bait. Um, what is does setting your bait sense. does does setting your bait site like further? You'd mentioned 200 yards off the road or whatever. I find a lot of baits that are like like you said, 200 yards off the road, and it's because people don't want to lug their bait in. I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, but mine was uh, the one that I had a ton of action on was three quarters of a mile from the road, and it's really not that bad. Um, pop, no. popcorn is surprisingly a lot heavier than I initially gave it credit for, but. Um, I got it in there just fine, and I didn't have any hound hunters coming off, and I, I was quite a ways away from the road. Do you think that that made a difference, or um, does that matter? Because I'm sure I was pulling bears down. Like, you'd have to go up the hill a little bit and then drop way down probably just about three-quarters of a mile to actually hit the road. Do you think bears are crossing the road to get to that bait barrel at that point, or – like, I don't know if there's no, a distance. I think the, the further back you are, the better, you know, I mean, um, we're, we're a, a, like a no motorized vehicle road where a hound hunter really, you know, can't be, mm-hmm. well, he can, but you know what I mean? More than likely not going to be. So if you can go back there three quarters of a mile, you know, put a little effort, you only got one or two baits probably is all you put out. I'm thinking. Um, yeah, yeah. so, so yeah, maybe put in a little more effort and just get it back further. And I think you'll have better luck. And your bears won't be chased off, you know, chased off the bait every other day by a hound guy, you know. But I if you go this. on a main a main road and and uh, set up a bait 200 yards off the road, I mean, you're more than likely going to have a hound hunter come through. I can, yeah, yeah, I, I would totally, I would vouch for that. I've seen it happen a lot. There's there's this <laughs> one spot I was I was hunting elk last year, and like um, 
the bait barrel was so close to the road that I hadn't even, you know how when you're elk hunting and it's September and you're archery hunting and you kind of just initially when you leave the truck want to get a little distance before you really start getting into hunting mode? Like I hadn't Mm -hmm. bugled yet. I hadn't done any of that. I'm talking this bait barrel was like 40, 50 yards from the road. Um, and you could see the trail, the, the bear were coming down the knob of the bend of this road and straight down to this bear, bear, bear barrel. So I guarantee you some houndsmen found that spot, um, mm-hmm. like probably multiple times. And he had a trail camera there. I pulled some faces in his trail camera. I wonder if you've ever, if it, if, if it set it off, <laughs> right. I always do, man. I always like to mess with people's cameras, not in a way that I, I touch them. I just like to, you know, smile, and wave. smile, wave. Pull faces, whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, no. So that could that could possibly just you describing it to me. That could possibly be a houndsman setting bait. the bait barrel. Yeah. Why? Why would that be? Because it's close to the road, and they can just they're rigging, so they're just they're you know that they, they might strike a bear before they get to the bait, but if they pull up to the bait, they can walk down there real quick and see if a bear's been in there, and then turn their dogs loose. Gotcha. That um, makes sense. Not for sure, because I, I don't know for sure. Maybe it but, was. Yeah, I if, didn't if, even think about it, that. Yeah, if it was a if it was a boot hunter or bait, you know, just a regular bait hunter, not a houndsman, they yeah, they messed up. Huh. And, but I do find a lot of baits. I do, I told you just a little bit ago, I found seventeen baits this year, <laughs> and a lot of it a lot of it's because people weren't getting that far off the road, and so my dogs will they'll strike because there's bear sin all over, you know. Sure. Sure. And then I got these, you know, we got these fancy GPSs now and I'll see, you know, it might be an old track or something. And they, they kind of trail down the road about 200 yards. And I almost know cause they'll stop moving and they're sitting there and I'll tell myself, and she's down there eating on a, somebody's bait, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You... And I'll walk down there and sure enough, the dogs are down there having lunch. <laughs> mm. and they're still in the, do, do they still the bait when there's, it's like dog food or something in it? Oh yeah. They'll be down there getting a free <laughs> meal. <laughs> so that's how I find them, you know? Yeah. 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 And then I try, you know, like I said, I, I respect them and get the dogs and get out of there. I don't want to, I don't want no enemies, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but yeah. yeah, just, I think that the boot hunters have just put a little more effort into getting a little further in, like you're talking and, and a little further away from the roads. They'll, they'll pretty much get rid of that. Totally. Do you think it makes a difference setting a bait barrel? You know how when you're talking about you, you keep saying setting a barrel um, and they're down off the road. What about up? Does that make a difference in how the I, – I don't know why it would, but um, I, I guess it's just because that's what I always do. I always go up with my bait barrel. Hmm. I never go down. And so is is there something – Yeah, so I've – as far as just a good place to put a bait, is that kind of what? You're... Yeah, and 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 in the prevention of having, um, you know, a houndsman come by and and run run the bear out of there or whatever. You know, I mean, my dogs will strike stuff above the road all the time, you know. So I don't think okay. If any, you know, if the wind's blowing down the hill or something, they'll, you know, a lot of times my dogs strike a bear that they, the bear wasn't even in the road. The bear itself's up the hill two hundred yards, and the wind's blowing down and they can smell it and they'll they won't say a word they'll run way up there about 200 yards on the gps and before they start barking you know where they hit the track hmm. so so they'll they'll smell they'll uh i don't think that'd really um help any what uh you'd mentioned the wolves getting into wolf areas have you ever had wolves mess with your dogs at all i've been really fortunate as much as i hunt i have not um um, lost a, a dog to a wolf yet. Yeah. Um, one of my guides, um, and good friend, uh, Travis Latier just lost two of his really good dogs. I've hunted with them a lot to wolves, uh, just three weeks ago. Mm. And it was a, fir- and he's a hard hunter. I mean, this guy hunts hard and he, it was the first time he'd lost it. So, um, and it was in that new area. I just told you I bought a new area sure. for, for outfitting and it was in that area. So that was a real bummer. So that's – the wolves have changed everything for houndsmen. Yeah. See, when I was a kid growing up here hunting, I, we didn't even worry about that stuff. You know, there wasn't any wolves, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yep. yeah, that's kind of – and I let's see. I found my first wolf track in 97. Oh, okay. This far north? As far north as, as where you're yep. – yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. yep, between me and you and uh, 
um, I was actually staying in cabins that were out in the woods that the, the forester that I was hunting with had access. I had the hounds and stuff and we were lion hunting and I thought it was a lion track when I first seen it, you know, up there on the snowmobile and, and I was like, Oh, it must be a female with some yearlings because there's, you know, more than one track. And I pulled up there and I was, I seen it was a wolf track, you know, right away. So, um, man, I, your, sorry, hounds, somebody. your hounds must be going nuts in the back right now. <laughs> That's my wife's <laughs> poodle. <but laughs> somebody just knocked on difference. my door. I'll go into the other room. Sorry. No, it's fine. But, uh, yeah. So anyway, so that's, so that, that's when I, and I really didn't know how bad it was going to be at that time. And then, and then before I knew it, you know, this from 2000 to 2008 or something, I mean, you're hearing about guys as dogs getting killed. And, yeah. And I mean, I, I can only imagine how devastating that would be. When I say they're part of the family, oh, they're man. part of the family. Yeah. It, it would be, it, it would uh, rip me apart. Partner. Yeah. I, I, they're literally your hunting partner, mm-hmm. you know? And, uh, so the wolves really changed a lot in the hound hunting world throughout the years and not in a good way. Yeah. Changes what, the way we hunt and everything. What is your, what is your take on, uh, wolf management, uh, as, as an outfitter, like the wolves being obviously I, I, Idaho, I, and I don't want to misspeak here, but I'm, pretty sure that Idaho is probably the most aggressive state when it comes to wolf management uh, in tag allotments uh, in seasons trapping seasons um, you know I, I think I think Idaho has been pretty proactive mm-hmm. um, what what is your take on wolf management in terms of how it has affected uh, you, you know just wolves in general being released on a landscape Uh how it's affected your, your business. Um, I've never had an outfitter on talk about that, I guess. Does that make sense? How I'm asking that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, I think I know where you're going with it. I, so for me, um, you know, as bad as our elk got hammered, um, I was able to still always kill elk. And, uh, even when I started the business, so a lot of it was from growing up around here. So I was able to stay successful in my business, but I can, um, I know several different outfitters that it literally put them out of business. Yeah. Like they were done. I mean, the wolves had killed all the elk. Um, and they were like, I can't sell this hunt anymore. Um, we're done. And I mean, I can't imagine if that happened to me. I mean, we've got our whole heart and soul. Like I said, we trained a retirement at the time, everything to start this business and to, just think of what that does to the economy. Oh, for sure. It's it, it, it's huge, especially uh, what zone is that down there that just got freaking wiped out elk-wise? The Locksaw uh, or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's another one. I, I want to say it's like Unit 10 or something, but anyway, I, I, it doesn't matter. 10A or something. Yeah, 10A. Yeah. Uh, down by the reservoir and stuff. Yeah, they got hammered down there. And I know a few outfitters, yeah. Yeah. They got hurt. Yeah. Um. It's it's an interesting conversation, and I, I think that that's that's something that uh, a lot of people might not understand. I, I guess I bring that up a lot because I've been having a lot of discussions lately um, uh, around the wolf issue, uh, and not not necessarily on the show. Um, it's something else I'm working on, but the the wolf issue and the the, the man the people just have blinders on um, when it comes mm-hmm. to wolves. The, the impact, the negative impact. It's not just, you know, wolves kill a couple of elk here and there. That's, I think, what the perception is. Um, mm-hmm. That's just not the case. I mean, they wipe out economies. They wipe out entire populations. They they displace entire populations of ungulate species. And uh, the effects are just far more reaching than just the fact that hunters see fewer elk. Um, and, and so the argument... I think just has to start being made a little bit more uh, loudly and more from a unified voice, I guess, uh, from these mm-hmm. pro, uh, against these pro wolf advocates that are just so freaking set on this idea that wolves are such a keystone species and above all other species that they need to be put on this pedestal and and protected no matter what the consequences are. And this fantasy that they they help the the landscape and the habitat recover and it just goes on and on. I man, I could just go on a rant for like the next two hours on it. It drives me crazy. 
Oh yeah. I mean, it's, they're just lunatics. That's the easiest way to say it. I mean, it, they don't have a clue, you know, I mean, um, I see it in the, the guys that attack the hound hunting hunters, you know, 90% of those guys have never even hound hunted, you know, they just, they don't even know what they're talking about, first of all, but the that, damage, the damage that wolves did to Idaho is, you can't even, I mean, it costs this state tons of money. Mm -hmm. I mean, tons of money. Um, the businesses that put out the outfitters that put out of business and stuff is just disgusting. I mean, our, they got rid of them for a reason, Yeah, you know, for sure. And, for sure. um, I'm not saying they don't have their place in the world. I mean, they're, they're a beautiful animal. I mean, I think everybody would agree with that. Yeah. But they, they are like the worst cancer they possibly could have put into Idaho. Well, and that's what it was like with the, cancer. You know, it's problem, getting better now. Yeah, it is getting better. The trappers are doing a really good job in particular. Um, mm -hmm. But the what, what you're seeing in – I think – that here's the thing. We have over 1,500 freaking wolves in the state of Idaho alone. That mm -hmm. is beyond the number – of what the objective was by the United States Forest Service for the entire tri-state area, meaning Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. Idaho alone surpasses that number. And so if wow. when we're talking about, you know, wolves are – because I, I agree with you. I, I don't think that they should be, uh, you know, completely annihilated. There is something cool about having some wolves here and there on the landscape. It does make it a little bit more authentic. But, you know, back in the heyday of wolves, wolves were never at this crazy number that they are now. They were managed you know? by natives. They were managed yep. by – and, and towards the Pleistocene, they were managed by big cats and, and other things that kept wolf numbers very low. That's why wolves reproduce at such a high rate of, uh, you know, efficacy. It's it's mm -hmm. not like it's not like they're just prolific breeders for the hell of it. No, they they adapted to that level of forty percent breeding rates per year because they were so, um, you know, heavily managed. Whether it was through the the natural species like big cats and 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 other things of that nature, and then also the Native Americans that knew the downfall and the and the competition um that they created and so when we're talking about wolves my my goal is to get it back down to that that you know 300 range of mm -hmm. what the idaho fishing game determined idaho could manage for 300 is a good number i think that that number would make it so that our elk aren't getting wiped out our elk are now um you, you know they're they're leery of wolves they they know how to react to them they can avoid them mm -hmm. a lot better uh, than they were like, you know, say in 1995 when they didn't have a clue and just stood there and let the wolves kind of come on and, and rip them apart. Um, yep. But but this whole thing where we've got north of 1,500 wolves in the state of Idaho alone is ludicrous. It's freaking That's ludicrous. too many. It's way yep. too many. We just don't yep. have the habitat for it. So uh, sorry about nope. my voice, man. I'm still I'm just getting over a cold. Um, and so I'm starting to lose my voice here a little bit. I need, to, I need to quit getting <laughs> yeah, worked up the wolf, over wolves, getting on man. The wolf will do that. Shit. <laughs> Shit. Yeah, yeah no. And I, I think the key, one, one good thing we're living in a state that's managing them now, you know, Yeah. Yep. on private ground, whether it's private ground or, you know, where they can trap you around or just trap more of them seasons longer. That's a start. You that know, I wish it would never, I wish it would have never got there. Yeah. And I feel like they could do some things to speed that up to get to the numbers you're talking about, but whether they do or not. But you think, uh, you, you know, you think of some of these states, what, like I think Wisconsin's really starting to see, you know, remember we were there 20 years ago. Yeah. They're, you're, you're here. That's where I'm hearing of most of the dogs getting killed, you know, in Wisconsin and stuff. And they're, and you talk to them guys and they're like, we don't have any deer left. And, yep. And it's and, killing us, and it's like, oh, we were there, you know. So they, those states are going to have to figure out how to start managing them and managing them quick. Or well, they're not going to be able to good. now because they just relisted them and everywhere but Wyoming, uh, Idaho, and Montana. So these yeah. these groups, these pro wolf advocate groups, yeah, if if people disgusting. out there think that they don't have an impact, look, there there's there's a couple of groups groups on like Instagram. Um, if, if you're on Instagram and, and, and you, uh, th these wolves, or I'm sorry, one of the groups is called wolves of the Rockies and another one's called like Wyoming untrapped, you know, you know, these different groups, they're advocating on a daily basis to set petitions up to send to the United States fishing game, um, 
like th- these petitions are constant and nonstop to have these wolves relisted because they act like these wolves are getting freaking annihilated by hunters and trappers. Um, when the reality is they're not, they are, they are no. not, I mean, th- th- they're, they're making this big push in, in Montana, but in Montana last year, I, I want to say the number was only like, like 248 wolves were either, uh, hunted or trapped, uh, you know, harvested. And so when you compare that to the number, the total number of wolves, which is close to a thousand in the state of Montana, that, that number is going to be replaced the next pup season rolls around and, and more so than, than we're actually taken out. Idaho is the only place where the, the number has stabilized. And that's because our fishing game has, has uh, be, gotten pretty aggressive with, with these, uh, these trapping season, these hunting tags, uh, that they're allowing. Anyway, I, I don't mean to take this into a whole wolf conversation. It's just been a big topic for me lately. Yeah, no, I'm glad that you're uh, talking about it. I mean, that's important, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, we've seen the damage that it can do, you know, although you're right, you know, our elk have adapted some. And, they um, have adapted. But, but um, they're yeah, still not, that's... they're still not where they used to be. I mean, I, in my opinion, they're still a lot more, you know, they're they're a lot more reclusive than they used to be. They're not as vocal. They're still getting wiped out by the hundreds every year, or by the thousands every year, not hundreds. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm I'm curious to know. Actually, this might be a good question for you, Bradley. Um, you're a guy that hunts both mule deer and whitetail deer. Do you feel like the wolves have had an impact um, on one of those over the other one, like more so over mule deer, for mm-hmm. example? Uh, then yep. maybe whitetail. What's your take on that? So, yeah, I am out there a lot, you know, I'm out there all winter mm-hmm. and stuff. And I think this is what I think. And it's just my opinion. Um, and I try to pay attention, you know, with the tracks I see and the kills I find, cause I find a lot of kills and stuff. I think that our deer are at threat right now, worse than our elk. And, and the reason I say that is cause Cause as, cause we're managing them. So a lot of the wolf mm-hmm. tracks I'm finding. So you remember in 95 to 2000 or whatever, you were out there hunting, I'm assuming quite a bit. Not, not in Idaho at that point, not in Idaho. Okay. I, I was in Utah. Well, so then I'll, I'll, I'll talk for you then. Okay. So I was seeing, I even found uh not far from my house here. I found a pack of 17 tracks crossing the road one way. Jeez. This so there was back huge, the there 90s? was huge tracks. Well, that was probably the early 2000s, actually, when I found that. But I was just saying back when when they were get, the when day. they were real bad, killing all killing all the elk, and we were finding them. I found s- several elk that were hamstrung, still barely alive. You know, when I was cat hunting, and wow. I mean, I got some brutal pictures and and just nasty uh, things on on elk half dead or in the water freezing and shivering with just matted down wolf tracks. But, but anyways, where I'm going with it is it was big packs, you know, probably eight, nine, 10 on the average in a pack. Right. Uh-huh. Well, I've been, and, and I'm just speaking for the area I'm hunting, you know, I, I hunt a pretty big chunk. I hunt, you know, four or five different units and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, what I'm seeing now, I'm not finding those big packs of wolves. So I, I'm finding a lot of singles. Really? Um, so I think, you know, the, the people are either trapping them or they got broke up or split up from their pack or what whatever so i'm finding a lot of like two running in a pack or just even and like i said just singles and those singles wolves um i'm noticing are killing the deer well yeah i mean a single wolf i think they're, they're running them you know running taking them. an elk yeah exactly so they've and you know how smart a wolf is they're survivors, you know, mm-hmm. and I think mm-hmm. they've learned to do that where they're, where they're not, you know, the wolves kind of depend on each other. They run in big packs and stuff and, um, and they can really take down a moose or an elk pretty easily with four or five wolves, you know, yeah. or more, um, where, where a deer is going to be a lot easier to handle, um, um, with just one or two wolves, you know? Yeah. So I've you- been noticing that, you know, the last few years that, that I'm finding more deer kills by wolves than I than I ever used to when yep. a lot, most of the time it seemed like wolves and I mean, moose and elk, you know? Yeah, for sure. For sure. I, I, I have, I have noticed it. It's interesting. You say that I've noticed a decline in, uh, I used to find moose all the time, uh, ripped apart by, by, uh, wolves. Uh, and it's actually been, I don't think I saw any moose kills last year, 2021. Um, now that could just be, you know, coincidence. I didn't, I didn't come across right. whatever. 
Um, the deer that you're seeing and uh, that that are getting a kind of a toll taken on them is it? Do you think it's more whitetail or or more mule deer or is it? Because you're in an area that has kind of a mix. I think it's heavier on the whitetail side, um, for yep. sure, uh, numbers wise. It but, is. Um, what are you seeing as far as that goes? Um, that's a that's a tough question. You know, there's no doubt that, like I said, these these wolves are killing them. You know, and and mm-hmm. like I do a real good job of managing managing the lions and stuff. Maybe need to work on the wolves a little more. But uh, there there's a few different things. Uh, Idaho's grown the amount of hunters, um, the logging. Um, and I'm a log. I log for 14 years. I'm mm-hmm. definitely not. I, I I respect the loggers a lot, but around us where I'm hunting, you know, they've really built roads, opened the country up, and um, made it really really easy to hunt, you know. Yeah. And you get a lot more hunters. Um, and I think so. I think the wolves and that change and this kind of changed everything. It's it's really not helped our deer population, if that makes sense. Just sure. a little bit of almost a little bit of everything. And the technology and everything we got nowadays, it's just, um, it's just hard on the deer. Kind of that, that perfect storm, huh? Perfect storm. Yeah, that's kind of how I feel. Um, and I'm not trying to give the wolves any credit because they've done their damage. But, um, you know, and it depends on where you're hunting. You know, of course, you know, you could be hunting backcountry that, that don't have any logging or roads. But I'm just talking a lot of this country where I hunt, which I'm glad I have that because some of my clients, you know, are older people and I can get them around good. Yeah. 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 So it's nice. But but you do have more hunters. What are, Do you, do you have of, an opinion on uh, what hunters are doing uh, to make this worth or worse? Uh, maybe, I don't know. I, Cause again, I, I feel like an outfitter just, you guys are out there so much. You're, you, you mm-hmm. see these, you like, you get to a point where you even know which animal is which on an individual basis sometimes. Um, yeah. so you're out there a lot and I'm, I'm just curious, like what hunters may be doing, uh, to, to compound the issue of wolves and, and predation and, and other things that are taking a toll on the numbers. I know, there's opinions out there as to shooting younger bucks versus older bucks or shooting too many does or, you know, all the, those, those debates are happening everywhere. What's, what's your take on all that? Um, so just as far as like what, what they should be shooting or what they shouldn't. Is that what you're, yeah. Or, or any just, other, uh, or any what other they're behavior, doing to... um, you know, are there too many tags? Are there too many, you know, I don't know. I don't, I, I'm just, I'm just yeah. trying to uh, brainstorm. Think... Yeah, you know, and I, I'm always careful with that s- subject because, you know, we're lucky, you know, to buy a tag and go hunting. I mean, mm-hmm. we're running out of states to do that in. Yep, for sure. You know, you got to build these points and, and all this. And, yes, you're going to have a good quality of a hunt. But I grew up hunting. I want to hunt every year. You yeah. Know? Yep. And Me too. Uh, so we've got to we've got to. Uh, but I think that they did they did reduce the amount of non-residents here in idaho i think the, um, the biggest thing they did too that i i want to give them kudos for is they uh they dispersed the non-residents better so like not every non-resident hunter is going to the same three units every year you know what i mean yeah um, i think they that's gotta gonna pick make, their unit yep yep i, I think that's going to make a big difference yeah i think that that'll help and make the locals happy mm-hmm. i uh i don't know how much difference it is because i always tell it you know my, me and my guides talk about this kind of stuff there's so many more people here in Idaho than there ever used to when I was a kid, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. so in my mind, yeah, they're, they're getting out, they're getting over hunted in a way, but it's really not necessarily from the out of stater. It's the low, there's so many more locals. The residents are just uh, unbelievable. I mean, I mean, you go anywhere, you know, probably you probably have it even, maybe even worse than I got it. You're going to see people in a lot of them. Well, and it never used to be like that. So, and I, I mean, I, I everybody has a right to hunt. Like I'm, I'm not saying that. I just there could be. There's definitely some management issues. I would say. Sure. Deer hunt, for sure. It's it's always tough because you and I could sit around a campfire where we're not recording, and we we could probably have a little more honest conversation <laughs> about, right, yeah. about this particular subject because it is it is touchy, man. There is a fine balance, like um. Mm-hmm. Between you, between where you live and where I live is this county called Kootenai County, 
And yep. for like two years in a row, it's been one of the fastest growing counties in the entire nation. And yep. and when you go to like Coeur d'Alene, you could tell like it, it takes forever to get anywhere in Coeur d'Alene. That, the infrastructure is not set up for that many people. And that's one of the big reasons why uh, my wife and I fled uh, Kootenai County. We're like, we're out of here, man. <laughs> Screw this freaking yep. traffic. It's, it's just not designed <laughs> for that many people. And, you know, culturally, the people that are moving to, to Coeur d'Alene, are, they're not Idahoans, man. I mean, come on. They're, they're not Idahoans. Yep. They want to be, I guess, but but this, it's just not my kind of people. Um, no. So we got the hell out of there. It's just uh, it's just not our kind of place anymore. But And so there's a lot to be said for, you know, the, the alarm that guys like you and I get who, um, you know – we we grew up out west where this is this is our kind of place right and, and mm-hmm. you know i grew up in utah and utah's going through the same situation where we used to go to kmart to get our deer and elk tags you know mm-hmm. and, and it was no big deal but now utah's gone down this weird you know point system way and and it's it's really tough for even residents just to get a get a tag uh in a lot of cases especially some of these more popular areas and and idaho's getting to a point where i don't know what the answer is because I personally hate to do away with the over-the-counter situation, um, mm-hmm. it's a big draw for me. It's it's a big it's a big deal, and but we're getting a lot of out-of-staters that are moving here, and it's just gonna I don't know I don't know what the solution is. I, it is you know it's scary. It's it is something's scary. gonna have to give you know and and I you know we talked about wolves and predators and stuff. Um, my biggest threat, and I'll just be honest. And what scares me the most, and I tell my wife this all the time, um, I mean, we are so into my business, it's too late to turn around. So, like, sure, I've, I, my livelihood feels threatened by all the people that are here hunting now. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you, you got to say you say you paid me five thousand dollars to take you elk hunting. You don't want to go see 50 side by sides. and yeah. 30 guys bugling at you. And that's what it is now, man. You know, the, I know. That's what it is. It's tough. So it, it's a real touchy subject with me. I get re- really worried about it. I understand everybody loves to hunt, but we've we're at the point where we're gonna have they're gonna have to figure something out. Now, point system, you know, like I said, I love the over the counter thing. I mean, that's just gonna have so much more. Uh, um, sorry, my other phone's ringing. So much more. Uh, it's probably Dirk. He's getting he's getting worked up. We're talking about this. He knows what's going on. <laughs> Yeah. Let me in on this. <laughs> Let me talk, he'll say. <laughs> but <laughs> no, so yeah, it's it's just I don't know what the answer is either. But yeah, like but like the the point the point system for me as a business owner, like I feel sorry for those outfitters, you know, they're you know, they might have a group of six guys that want to go hunt, but they can't get them tags cuz they don't have enough points built yep. and yep. and then they they have so much more paperwork than I got. You know, they're putting guys in, so they're not only are they putting guys in for points, and then they got to, okay, you got enough points, you still want to come on a hunt, you still want to spend your money with me? I mean, they've got a whole other level of paperwork yeah. to yeah. deal with than me. Um, so it's a, it's something that's going to be have to be addressed, though, soon. I mean, it it's, you I know, in the I, technology, you know, honestly, you know, there's more people in the woods now than there ever been. Exactly. I mean, I, people are finding spots. I grew spots. up looking at the sun and having a compass in my pocket. Mm-hmm. Yep. Walking around. I mean, nobody's just memorizing. Scared. Just, yeah. Yep. I, I know exactly what you're saying. Just memorizing you're those around, mountains. You're like, holy cow, there's a footprint out here. Yeah, Somebody's I know. Been I know. Right? <laughs> like, it's crazy. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I'm blown away. I don't know what, I don't know what the solution is. Um, I, you know, I, I'm on the, I, I'm in this like kind of a tight spot with it, with, with what I, I should or shouldn't say. Because mm-hmm. the growth does annoy me, I, and I, I don't, I don't make any, you know, I'm not quiet about it. It, it sucks. It sucks. We, it we, sucks. we've been here in Idaho for a long time, and and mm-hmm. we, we were here before the big boom of of you know growth. We we came mm-hmm. uh, back in in the early 2000s, and and mm-hmm. you know, actually, it's funny. My wife and I both grew up in Utah, but we didn't meet until we uh, moved to North Idaho. Um, huh. and Good so, place to meet, right? It was crazy. <laughs> And, and so we, it was, it was back, back before it was a popular, it was a trendy thing to do to move to Idaho. Right. And so I feel like we have, <laughs> so, and plus we didn't come from uh, big urban areas. We, it was just kind of yeah, t- tit for tat in terms of what we traded. 
uh, small town right. Utah to small town Idaho. You know, that's that's what we did. So totally different yep. ball game. But the the growth does need to be addressed in in a way that is it is threatening to to a lot of us. And and I don't blame people that are moving from some of these areas right. that want to escape maybe the politics or the the population that they're dealing with. Um, but I mean, shit, Idaho's there's more places than Idaho. Go, go find some other places, I mean, <laughs> I know, man. And 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 to top it off, go to southern Idaho. No, you don't need to come to northern yeah. Idaho, right? Go to that but, wide open country where yeah. you can see something. Right? I, that's what I like. You you can go down and watch those coyotes run for three days straight. It's so wide open. Go on down there. I'm like, we don't need you. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. It, it is. It's a it's a touchy one because yeah, like I said, I don't blame people that want to move here or or no. to other western states for what they're dealing with, but at the same time. I, we can't handle that much more growth. I, no, I mean, we shit. can't, and I'm afraid it's just getting started. I mean, me too. You look at where where I'm at right now. I've had Hughesnet internet that I wouldn't even be talking to you on mm-hmm. uh, six months ago, but we we upgraded to this Starlink. Oh yeah, man! I just and got it I'm too. You, so that that's awesome, ain't it? Dude, but it's it a game also, changer. Think about it, think about it though all the people from the cities moving to Idaho and they got good internet now. <laughs> yeah. Now they can get Starlink and that's, and they, I, I mean, I, I live on 26 remote acres, man. And I, I mainly work from home because I've got Starlink. Yep. Yeah. That's amazing. Ain't it? Yeah. And yeah. so I think that, that, you know, the technology has brought a lot of people to, you know, is what I was going, where I was going with that. But, uh, I think dudes I like you like and I, I, we, don't, I don't want Idaho to get any bigger. It's already I don't big either. Enough, that's for sure. I don't either. Like I can't believe how big Lewiston's gotten, and oh, and, and yeah. Moscow, um, and freaking Sandpoint is is growing out of control too. We were just picking on Coeur d'Alene, but I mean it's it's happening everywhere. So and and it's it's just kind of bursting at the seams at this point. That's funny you brought uh, Sandpoint up. Me and my wife, I guess it was about a year ago. Mm-hmm. About this time, yeah. So about a year ago, I, uh, I was like, let's get away you know it's a little bit of our downtime right now you know i just got done with lion hunts and shows and stuff so it's a little, kind of our downtime right now and i was like let's go yeah. get away you know get a babysitter and go i haven't been up to sandpoint for a long time you know so we went up there and got a i think it was a best western or something for a couple days and i spent i'm not kidding you the, the first day we i stayed the first night in the motel room and we had two nights ordered uh-huh. and um i don't know how many times i was told to put a mask on Oh really? <laughs> and, oh, that uh, doesn't surprise me. Sam, standpoint. In Sandpoint. Yeah. And I and anyways, uh, all the people, like I, I hadn't been there in quite a few years, you know, and all the people. I never stayed my last day in the motel room. I told my wife I'm going back to Coeur d'Alene at least. Dude, it is. And I got out of Sandpoint. And Coeur d'Alene's horrible. Yeah, Coeur d'Alene's but, getting uh, bad, but Sandpoint's worse. Sandpoint is is yep. like. San Fran Sandpoint now at this point. Yes. Um, it, it's yep. a very interesting little dynamic because I'm about 30, 35 minutes out of Sandpoint where I live now in Clark Fork. Um, mm-hmm. Well, some of the Clark Fork folks are going to be like, God damn, wait, wait, you don't drive the speed limit or what? No, I, I take my time. All right. It's about. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, um, yeah, no, Sandpoint's a different animal, man. Uh it's it's not even recognizable from just uh, just a decade ago, dude. Uh, it's it's a totally different town. Yeah, so, that's sad. Uh, that breaks my heart. Yeah, <laughs> what a beautiful it is. beautiful country, too. It is beautiful. it is heartbreaking. Uh, we yeah. it's that's funny you said that because we got balled out uh, by somebody for not wearing a mask. Like it was only like three or four weeks ago, and oh, geez. I was like, what are you freaking talking about? Are, are you not paying attention to like what the CDC even says anymore? Like nobody thinks masks work anymore. Grow up. <laughs> yeah, Get I out know. of here. Like shit, man. I I'm sick of talking about it. Anyway. Oh, I know it. Luckily uh, for me in Northern, I never changed my life a bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Me so. neither, man. Me neither. So, well, cool, man. I, I, I really enjoyed this conversation. We're going to have to do this again, but next time I, I want to come down there and check out your place, man. Yeah, you're welcome anytime. I'd love to. And maybe, maybe next time we can talk a little more about elk hunting or something, but yeah. I love talking to hounds. I hope I answered most of your questions, but uh, yeah, well, I think we so. definitely have to um, stay in touch and, and you're welcome down here anytime. And, and I think you'll like it and I can 
you can look at them, get you some ideas on, on your cabins you're thinking about or cabin to get yeah, by. Can, that's what I'm thinking. I, I, I was just looking. It looks it looks like about the perfect size to build that I can, you know, make my wife happy to have a place to put the Christmas tree and, uh, you know, have a have a place where we can kind of just kick our uh, mm-hmm. shoes off and hang out at, at, during the winter because it gets pretty tight in that fifth wheel. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah. Well, do you, yeah, I, yeah, exactly. I'm sure it does. Yeah. But, uh, you got any trees there on your property, like big, bigger trees? Cause I, I uh, cut most of my lumber. If you've seen on those cabins, like I cut all my, I have a sawmill. So. Oh, perfect. Yeah. I, if you're ever so, looking for some rough cut lumber. I, I am, I am actually, I'm because, uh, the trees that are on my property, it's, it's pretty thick. I've got, I've got an old growth section of my property that I don't want mm-hmm. to destroy. Uh, right. and the rest of it's kind of a, a younger forest. So these, these trees are only about 30 feet high. Um, mm-hmm. and so they're not big enough, but, um, you know, yeah, we, could, we, yeah. we could talk for hours on this stuff, man. I love oh, it. Oh yeah, for sure. Love it. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, and, and we're going to, so let's, let's jump off the show here. Uh, okay. again, I appreciate you coming on and, and to answer your question. Yes. You, you answered a lot of the questions I had, uh, regarding hound, hound hunting and houndsmen. And I think, uh, dispelled some myths and hopefully we could smooth out the uh, the contention that sometimes comes up between elk or bait hunters uh, when it comes to houndsmen because uh, yeah you know there's just no knowing and so i appreciate you clarifying a lot of that and um yeah. do you want to give uh, everybody kind of an idea where they could find idaho whitetail guides or outfitters uh and give us kind of a pitch for for folks looking for an outfitter in idaho yeah so we uh we do uh Whitetail hunts, mule deer hunts, bear hunts, bait and hound. I recommend the hound. I, I'm wrong. I'm going to talk you into the hound one mm-hmm. way or the other. But so um, uh, we do it all. You know, whatever you can hunt in Idaho, we do it. Um, we have a website. Wait a minute. You do, what do you mean you do it? it? Like, do you do snowshoe hair? Well, I shouldn't say I do it all. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just <laughs> I could. I could probably line that up. You for probably you. could, man. I, it wouldn't, I wouldn't surprise. I, I wouldn't be surprised. I, I bet yeah, I could almost guarantee that hunt too. I think. I will bet you could. <laughs> Shoot, I could guarantee that hunt on my place. If somebody wants to pay yeah. to ride them out. <laughs> right. So yeah, no, I I'm not a big techie guy, but I started Instagram about a year ago, and um, when COVID or a couple years ago now, I guess when whenever COVID hit, I got kind of nervous, you know, because they shut our shows off. It's oh like, yeah. Holy cow, you know, that's where I got my clientele. Can't go. Luckily been in business long if it would have been our first year or two in business it would have put us out right then oh but i'll bet yeah luckily we've got enough clientele yeah and we could go into that you know you know a lot of those clients are a bucket list so once they've killed an elk with me you know they're going on to new zealand and hunting a stag or something you know sure. so you got to constantly constantly be looking for new blood yeah but I, I, I anyways imagine. so yeah we got a you can check out our website. You can follow me on Instagram and Facebook. I, I don't do a lot. I've started doing more on Instagram and, and Facebook than I ever have before. So, yeah. Cool. Feel free to give me a call if you have any questions, and I'd love to talk to you. I love I love your website, man. Um, I know you Thank were kind of you were kind of ragging on it earlier that you need to update <laughs> it or whatever, but I, I like it uh, because, it yeah, it just it kind of shows what you guys do. Um, mm-hmm. it, it talks about pricing and shows those little cabins. I can't believe you let Dirk stay in. Um, so guys, what <laughs> I know I'll he do, left a mess too there. I'll bet he did. I'll bet he did. You had to go in and vacuum and stuff after, oh, didn't yeah. you? I think, yeah, my wife spent like two hours cleaning up after him. <laughs> <laughs> the grime alone in the shower. Jeez. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Just so <laughs> what I'm going to do, guys, I, I'll, I'm going to put um, IdahoWhatTailGuides.com in the show notes. I'm going to put the uh, the Instagram in there and anything else we need to put in there. So if you guys are interested in, in booking a hunt, um, you still have availability for 2022? No, we are booked up solid. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. Sorry to tell so, you that. Yep. <laughs> well, <laughs> There's always but it don't hurt to get a hold of me. And, yeah, yeah. And line that up, you know. So all that information is going to be in the show notes. Uh, if you guys want, reach out to Bradley. Check it out. I think uh, if you're looking for a guide service in Idaho, uh, this is probably one of the better ones to um, one of the more legitimate ones. Uh, I, I mean, just follow him on Instagram and, and you'll see what I mean. So, uh, Bradley, thanks again for coming on, man. Uh, great conversation. Um, I feel like I've got a new friend, so I appreciate you coming on. Definitely. Thanks for having me. And we'll do this again for sure. And um, have a good one. You too. You 
made it all the way to the end. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. We sure appreciate your support. This is Jim Huntsman signing off and reminding you to check us out at Instagram at The Western Huntsman and on Facebook at The Western Huntsman. And you can also check out the website at thewesternhuntsman.com. Thanks again. We'll see you guys next time. Stay Western, and I'll see you on the mountain.